Now it is working. Okay. So I will start this. Um, am I showing my slideshow? It should just be like the uh yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, cut my video off as soon as I started recording. That was interesting. Okay. So welcome. Uh thank you for coming to Avoiding Predatory Publishers. Um, my name is Miranda Fair. I'm the publishing and open scholarship librarian um here at Towson University Library. Um, my email address is um up there if you have questions or anything like that. Uh so what we're gonna do today this wants to cooperate okay is we're going to talk um we're going to define our terms talk a bit about what makes something predatory um and kind of like why it's a problem behind beside the obvious um and talk about some different terms people use for things like this um we'll go over some tools and resources that'll help you um like vet and check out some sources that you're looking at and then we'll talk about some strategies for assessing opportunities i say opportunities cuz i'm talking about mostly about publishers and journals but um i'm also going to talk about conferences because uh like fake conferences have become a problem recently too and then at the end i have some examples that we can look at and then i'll do a poll that's like do you think this is predatory or not? Um, we don't have to stick to those examples. If you have anything in mind that you've encountered in the wild that you're like, I don't know, this is sort of suspicious. Um, we can also take a look at that one too. So I'm not, not stuck on the examples I have chosen already. Um, so a bit about terminology first. The most common term people will use when they talk about predatory publishers is predatory. Um, this term's mostly credited to Jeffrey Beale. You might know him from Beale's List. He was this um, librarian from Colorado in like the early 2000s that came up with the list of like open access publishers that he found suspicious. Um, and that's kind of where this gained some traction. Um, there's some criticism out there that I would also say I agree with, um, that it did do a lot of damage as far as like in people's minds, making like anything open access equate with, um, a predatory publisher. Now, this was also like 20 years ago, maybe more than 20 years ago. Um, open access publishing is a lot more mainstream now. So I'd say that's not, like everybody's first thought when they think about predatory publishers but a lot of them because of the publication model that um has like a lot of them will adopt an author's pay publication model that is um sort of a ripe a rife uh area for for scamming um so this is the most common term that's used i don't like to use it i tend to use deceptive or fraudulent because that seems more descriptive to me um and also because I, I tend to associate predatory publishing with like those like phishing attempts. So you'll get those emails that are like, dear doctor, whatever, even if you're not a doctor, I get some that have the wrong title. Um, and they'll ask you to submit your paper to a journal that's maybe not even in your subject area or have you speak at this conference or um, say that like they'll publish your paper in this book for free. You just have to like buy a copy of the book. Um those are sort of the more, like I'd say, obviously scammy things. Um, the things that I find very like malicious and more disturbing are the journals that are deceptive and that they look legitimate um, on the surface, but but are not. Um, and those can be very damaging. Probably also hear the term paper mills a lot. Um, that's sort of along the lines of like diploma mills, like they're just generating a lot of content. Um, to get a lot of paper credits like so people can add things to their cv or um like have them get a lot of citations basically it's it's all part of that big racket this other one that is important to talk about is hijack journals which i think is a more recent problem um at first it was a lot of like journals that were in print and maybe weren't online yet um people who were not affiliated with the journal would set up a website for the journal or um if they already have a website, they'd make like a second fake website that that looked like it. Um, and they're, you know, using their name, using their ISSN. They're basically pretending to be them to get people to um, submit to those journals and then take their money um, for for a publication. Um, so the kind of definition of predatory, um, there was this article 
that was in nature that I read and they were talking about how all of these academics from a bunch of different countries came together. And after 12 hours of discussion, they came up with this definition, which is that um, predatory refers to entities that prioritize self-interest at the expense of scholarship and are characterized by false or misleading information, deviation from best editorial and publication practices, a lack of transparency, and or the use of aggressive and indiscriminate solicita solicitation practices. So that last bit is those emails I was talking about earlier that we we probably get pretty often. Um, the other things that I think um, are like a little more sinister are the like misleading information um, that they are deviating from good editorial and publication practices. So that's what we're going to focus on a bit today. Um, so generally what this boils down to is the characteristics of something like this is that it's either poor research or it might be fake research but it resembles legitimate research so it might have all of the formatting um in in the journals they might have an issn or to say they have an issn a lot of times they'll list an impact factor they'll say they'll index in all, in all of these places they'll have um a name of a journal that sounds you know, like, like it would be the name of a journal or it sounds very similar to a um, well-respected journal in that field. Um, generally, they'll publish any author who's willing to pay for it. Um, they may also sell authorship, which is different. So that doesn't involve the author submitting a paper and then paying to have it published. It's um, where like they already have a paper and they just say like, oh, if you pay, we'll put your name on this as an author, which is not great. Um, they might contain plagiarism, falsified data, things like that. It's important to note that these kind of things also show up in otherwise legitimate journals. Um, so that's this isn't unique to to this. Um, and they're generally not transparent about the processes. So like how their peer review system works, how you're able to um, like submit your article, how long to expect to wait. Um, typically, they're not transparent about fees either. So they'll either say there isn't one and then try to charge you or they'll have inconsistent information about how much the fee is or it's suspiciously low or suspiciously high. Typically, fees for an article, it's going to vary by discipline, but usually it's like a few thousand. Um, so if it's like, oh, I, I would say 10,000 would be suspiciously high, but there is a um, in Nature Journal that did that. Um, but generally, that's that's going to be kind of out of the realm of what is expected. Um, so other than the obvious, a few other reasons why this is a bad thing. Um, so it harms the integrity of the scholarly record. So if you've got a bunch of stuff coming out here that has bad or non-existent peer review, um, that's going to mean there's a lot of lower quality research out there. Um, it's important to note also that bad peer review research can exist anywhere. So not just in these fraudulent or deceptive journals, there are sort of, I call them otherwise legitimate journals that um, engage in research misconduct all the time. It's it's a big problem. I feel like we hear about that a lot. Um, it also like floods the selection of available papers and downstream users might not be as um, equipped to like evaluate what they're looking at they'll just see that it you know looks like a legitimate paper um and they might get bad information from there um it can also if you publish in it can harm your reputation especially if you're early career faculty or a graduate student it's not going to count towards tenure um i'm hoping i don't know i feel like personally if somebody got scammed by one of these like one time i wouldn't I'd hope it wouldn't be like career ending, but there are people out there who um, like make a lot of, you know, bad faith efforts to like continually publish in places like this just to to pad their own CV. Um, there are people who tend to get called out on retraction watch, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, and it's also costly um, in that, you know, you're being scammed out of money, um, but also it could be costly in that if you're using money that a funder gave you, they maybe are not going to be particularly happy about what happened with your publication output. Maybe they don't want to fund you again. Maybe that makes them look bad. Um, so there's a lot of bad things that can happen. Um so I have a list, a few lists of what to look for generally. I have them split into red flags and green flags. I have some for um, journals and some for conferences. And then I have things that are positive that you do want to find. I mean, generally for this list of red flags, this is stuff that you 
if you do find it, that's bad. If you don't find it, that's good. And then, you know, opposite with the green flags list. Um, this isn't exhaustive and we'll go over some other resources that you can check things against. I would say these are probably like the most common things that you'll see. Um, and they're also easy to find um, compared to some of the other information that might make something suspicious. Um, so I was talking about the inconsistent information about fees. That's um, something you definitely don't wanna see in a journal. Um, they might have no editors or no editorial board. Um, they also might have people that are added to their list without their knowledge. That's a little harder to check because you'd have to, you know, ask them and be like, are you actually on the board of this? Um, I mean, they, if they post their CV online and that doesn't show up on there, then that's pretty easy to, to check it that way. Um, but that's a thing they will do sometimes. Um, the, one of the big ones is that they promise very fast publication. So if that's like a selling point for why you should publish in there and they'll say, you know, you can have your article up in one to two weeks. I mean, if you've done peer review before, you probably can uh, say that the one to two weeks isn't going to um, be the most robust review of your article. So that's that's a bad sign. Um, another one would be agreeing to publish your article before even reading it. Um, so another one that's common, too, is um, like an invented or fake or I'll say unverifiable because they can be verified um, impact factors. A lot of them will say, oh, here's my impact factor for this journal um those don't exist like they don't the journal doesn't assign it to themselves someone else has to have assigned that impact factor to them so there's a few um places you can look um like journal citation reports um double check if it doesn't show up there they're probably making it up um lack of clear instructions about what to do with your paper um some of these places are going to have um not a lot of good information except how to make a payment so that's typically um and they also shouldn't be accepting money from you like they shouldn't have a portal to pay like prominently displayed on their homepage. that's something they'll typically talk to you about um once you've already been accepted and um like agreed to publish with them um we have some saying the saying goes you can get it fast cheaper good pick any two yes that's yes you cannot get all three and they tend to to promise all three but definitely not uh it's usually not good if it's fast um or cheap so um and also there's these other ones that i've added a star to because they, they kind of have caveats um so one thing is that they claim to be based in one country or they have a physical address in another sometimes you'll hear like oh they claim to be based here but they don't have a physical address I'd say that's less egregious than it used to be just because a lot of places are based online now, especially um, after uh, COVID when everything went remote. There are a lot of um, organizations that it no longer makes sense for them to have um, like a physical presence, especially if they don't have um, a like print, like physical print operation. So if it's online only, they might just be an online journal. So that's kind of less bad, but this tends to show up on the list. Another thing is poor spelling and grammatical errors. Um, a lot of time that's going to sort of unfairly, um, like a lot of journals will have to or feel that they have to publish in English just because that's, well, there's a lot of reasons, but that's kind of like a widely read and spoken language. And that's like a way to make sure your research gets cited a lot. So there's a lot of incentives for them to publish in English. If English isn't their first language, they might have some grammatical errors in there. Um, I wouldn't say that's an immediate like counting it out, but if it's a journal that claims to be from a predominantly English speaking country and they still have a lot of like egregious spelling and grammatical errors, then that's maybe more, more of a thing. So, um, take that one with a, a grain of salt, but that's something to think about. Um, so similar with conferences, there's a lot of fake conferences out there. I think they tend to target graduate students um, or, you know, people that are new, new to the field. Um, usually they'll have sort of unclear fees. Um, typically the sponsors don't make sense. Um, for so if they have sponsors and the sponsors don't make sense for what the topic of it is you can usually like check especially a lot of the like fake biomedical sponsors like i would you know sort of look into who they list as as their sponsors for biomedical conferences that tends to be more of an issue in that discipline for some reason um 
the editorial conference committee isn't listed. So they should be listing that information, even if they don't have a lot of this other stuff. Um, oh, we have a chat. So oh. once I traced a journal address to an apartment complex in suburban Maryland. Oh no. And another to a construction site um, on a site in London. Yes, that's uh, probably, they're probably not actually based there. Um, sometimes they might show up in like a strip mall. That's that's hard to know because they might, they might just have an office suite there. Um, but they probably don't, or based in an apartment complex, or they are actually based in an apartment complex, and it's just some guy who's like running a scam. So maybe that's correct for the scam. Um, oh yes, yeah, so a rundown house in Chicago. These are all very sinister. I think this would make like a fun um like a coffee table book of like places that these fake journals are allegedly based. Maybe I should do that. There's my proof of concept. Um so anyway back to the conferences so the uh submission guidelines might be unclear they might promise everybody will get in um which which probably isn't great you want there to be some kind of review um or you know get in as long as you pay your submission fee um so there's typically unclear information about dates and the agenda a lot of times we know the agenda isn't available until right before or shortly before because um they've got to you know get submissions and then set the schedule um, but if it's right before the conference, they don't have an agenda, that's probably not great. If the dates are inconsistent or it's unclear when they are, um, not great either. Um, if you're not familiar with the society or organization that's organizing it, so um, even smaller conferences, if they're, um, you know, affiliated with a university, it, it probably makes sense. If, you know, they're in their first year and it's a small group of people putting it on, it's probably not like a sinister scam situation um or if it's you know like a society you've heard of um but if it's something you haven't heard of that's a reason to look into it more and then a lot of these i would double check if it's the first year of the conference i mean of course every conference has to have a first year they have to start somewhere um but a lot of these ones um like the a lot of the fake ones will will kind of crop up and then not show up again once they've collected money from people. Um, so yes, this isn't like, if it's the first year, it's not going to completely like rule it out as being okay. But if it's been going on for like 15 years and you know, people have gone to it, you can generally trust that it's okay. Um, so some things you do want to look for um, in a journal um, when you're publishing there is that they adhere to COPE guidelines. Um, so that's the Committee on Publication Ethics. I have... And most of the things that are on this list are things that they list there. So um, did I share my whole screen and not just the PowerPoint? Like we have Cope's website displayed here now. Yes, I see okay, it. Cool. I, I've messed this up once. So I'm like afraid of it every time now. So um, Cope is is good. They've got a lot of like people that will, um, or different organizations that are, are part of it, that are members. Um, so they have also a lot of really good resources on like what um how how to write good policies for your journal and what types of policies journals should have. So typically these in their core practices are the main ones you want to see the journal have a clear policy for. So like how do they respond to misconduct? Um how do they define authorship? Um what what do they have the authors do to kind of determine who gets authorship and contributorship? Um what's their complaints and appeals policy cuz um you know you want to make sure that you can kind of still it's still a, it's an open conversation even after they've published something. Um conflicts of interest, you want those to be clearly um stated. Um, what are their policies on like oversight, um, like their copyright and maybe licensing policy, how the journals manage, what their peer review is, and then post-publication discussions. So like how how do you respond to something you don't necessarily agree with? Um, these are most of the things that I listed here. Um, another one that, uh, so clear peer, peer review policy, we, we want it to be peer reviewed. Um, so they should have... Um, a description of like how it's done rather than just say this stuff's peer reviewed. Um, then clear archiving or persistent access policy, I think is really important. Sometimes when you look things like this up in um, Cavils, which we'll look at in a moment, I think on the next slide, um, they'll say that's like a minor infraction that they don't have a persistent access policy. I think it's a pretty big deal because if you submit an article and you 
uh, have it published, you want to make sure it's going to be there. Like no matter what happens to the journal website, that it's not just going to vanish. Um, so usually you're going to, they'll say something like they have a deposit policy with clocks or locks or portico or something like that. That's a good thing to look for. Um, persistent identifiers, those are good to have. They're also good because you can double check them. So um, things like an ISSN, uh, sort of like the impact factors, that's not just like a thing the journal gets to pick, it's um, assigned to them. So it's verifiable whether or not that's their actual ISSN. Um, then whether they're assigning DOIs to the article, that's typically a good sign. If they have clear policies on copyright, conflict of interest. Another way to look at this, and I'll look at, I'll show you a few places you can find this information too, is if the publisher is a current member um, of a recognized industry group, that's typically a good way to double check doesn't always work as well for smaller publishers, but if they're affiliated with some kind of society or a trade association or an academic institution, which is helpful for like very small publishers because there's a lot of smaller journals that are based out of universities or university libraries, if they're affiliated with a legitimate accredited institution, they're, they're probably fine, even if that publisher isn't a member of an industry group. Um, so there's a few resources that, that I will go through that are helpful. Um, so one we have access to through the library is Cabell's Predatory Reports. Um, they've changed this a bit. Oh, I have to log in. Oh, a stale request. I've had this open for too long. That's what I get for trying to prepare in advance. We're going to try that again. It's thinking. Okay, so this is um a uh this is something that looks like a database that we have through the library. Um, it used to be called whitelist and blacklist. They don't call it that anymore. Um, it's now journalytics, which are going to be like information about your good journals and then predatory reports, which are going to be um, any of these journals that have, have made an infraction. So they'll tell you they have a lot of violations. They put them into different categories, which I think is helpful. Um, I don't, always agree with like where they put each thing in the category um whether they say it's like a minor infraction or like a very bad one um so let's see if you click view predatory report you can also search um a specific journal you can search by isn um title or discipline you can also look at all journals now so they've combined the two which is helpful um but we'll just look at this one so they can see what they have so they list, they give you an overview and then list their violations. They'll tell you a bit about what they're in, what the claims made by the journal were that aren't accurate. And if you go to violations, um, so they'll list them either as severe, moderate, sometimes minor. So yeah, I'd say this is pretty bad. They're hiding or obscuring relationships with a for-profit partner company. Ooh, they're associated with a conference. I think this is the first time I've seen that particular um once that's good surprise fees again that's that's a bad thing we've been talking about um oh so yeah they give like detailed descriptions about why so this one's gonna have you know prominent researchers who on their board but um they don't have to like do anything uh, like make any uh contributions as far as not that they have to write in it but to know you review what goes in there um they have a, a prominent statement that promises rapid publication I'd say that's probably worse than moderate. Um, and then business practices. Yes, they, they've they got reports of like people getting the invitations via email. Um, sending a lot of emails would be like a minor infraction. I'm going to see what some other ones are. Um, these are types of things that will show up there, though. Um, oh, yeah. Here's one about misleading metrics. So yeah, it can't really use impact factor if they're not like the official impact factors. Um, we've got that, more rapid publication. Yes, yeah, so these are just kind of fun to look at sometimes because you can see what they do. Um, journalytics is helpful also, um, and you can do, that'll tell you more information, but it's you no know, journals that you maybe would want to publish in. So let's say when I do this, they'll have information about the metrics. So if something does show up in journalytics, um, that's 
probably you're probably fine. Um, I will say that if something doesn't show up in journalytics doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. It just means it's not part of this this list. Um, so I'll talk a bit in a bit a bit in a little while about why um it's helpful to have like evaluation skills more than it is to rely on lists. Um, but basically what it comes down to is these lists um and you know, places to find information like this tend to be maintained by people. Um, and that takes, it's not automated. So that's going to take time that involves somebody like finding this and inputting the information. Um, a lot of this is self-reported by the publisher, but you know, someone has to like vet them and add it. Um, same thing with the like crowdsource lists. We'll look at a few of those in a little bit. Um, those um also can't necessarily keep up with like how fast and how sophisticated um some of these uh I will call them scammers they are scammers tend to be um so just having like good evaluation skills is is your best defense um but they'll typically have a lot more information here about like what the distribution is what their acceptance rate is sometimes they'll have information about like how quickly things tend to get published in here um you can also just search all journals and then so if you're like oh i am a i'm gonna look for a kinesiology journal um it'll give you both things that show up in journalytics and predatory reports but it's very clear which is which so yeah we have this international of journal of kinesiology and higher education that that one's probably fine tells you know how often they publish things like this and then they've got the predatory one with all their violations um okay yeah so here's an example people on editorial board without their knowledge or permissions so that was the one we were talking about um they also link to the website sometimes it's kind of fun to look at these oh yeah this one looks probably more more legit than some of them do um but we'll look at more examples later so that's one resource we have access to through here. There's also a few more that are openly available. So there's the directory of open access journals. Um, this is a um, also sort of they have to go through like a vetting process to be in here and they have to go through a further vetting process to get the um, DOAJ seal, which just means they have to hit like all of these um, different, I think it's under apply. Yeah, they have to like hit all of these criteria to be accepted. Um, so those those are typically fine. Again, not everything's going to show up in here. So um, if it doesn't, that doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. They might just not have found it yet. But if it does show up in here, it'll have some information about it. Um, let's see. I'll just keep looking up. That's what I'm thinking. Um, so they'll tell you whatever journals kind of come up in that field. Um, if you click on it, oh, here, this one has a seal. So this one's a Swiss journal of functional morphology and kinesiology. They tell you what they would, would charge. Um, they usually have links directly to these policies that we want to try to look at. They tell you information about their copyright policy, where they have things digitally archived. So they use clocks, which is a good sign. They have a deposit policy with Sherpa Roman, which is also good. Um, the mill give you an expectation kind of of how long things take to be published um a lot of this information is self-reported by the journal or is taken from their website um so take that with a grain of salt the other nifty thing they have here they link to the website but they also link to it in the ISN SSN portal so you can verify that that is actually their ISSN and not just one they made up um Another thing, too, that they've been maintaining recently, which I find very helpful, um, so you can always cross-check it. Um, so this, a lot of these are in, like, Google Sheets because they're, like, crowdsourced information. So they've last updated it a few months ago. Um, these are places or journals that have now or ever have claimed falsely that they're indexed in DOAJ. Um, so they might also put the logo on their website so maybe you'll see the logo on their website but it's helpful to double check them against here um see if they're actually if they have actually done that or not because that's not cool that they did that um so but again this is maintained by people it's you know 
people will submit them when they come across them in the wild. So it's probably not like 100% accurate. And a lot of these kind of have been caught. So it's been removed. Um, but it's good to know that they've done this anyway. Um, another thing that I was talking a bit about earlier are these other associations. So DOHA is kind of a good one. Another one you might want to look at is if you're looking at an open access publisher. If the publisher is a member of um, OASPA, I assume that's how you say it. Um, so they'll list like what their current members are. This is this is like a vetted organization. So typically, if they're publishers in here, that's going to be okay. And there's some you'll probably recognize, like AIPs in here. Um, they just list them alphabetically. So if you can find a publisher in here, they'll give you, you no know, more information about the member, um, about their website, who's who owns it. Um, so this is like owned by a nonprofit. Um, this is a journal based out or a publisher based out of South Africa. They've got some different information on them, so you can find more about them here. Um, there's also um, other places to look. There's This is like a diversity and inclusion group that is open access publishers. You can look at them as well. It's kind of major publishers that are part of that. Another thing I also like to look at is Retraction Watch. And one thing that they've put out somewhat recently, they have a lot of information about like hijacked journals. Um, and they are not, you know, just looking at predatory. They're looking at like research misconduct as a whole. Um, so it's always a fun read, I think, if you have some time. I mean, it's depressing, but it's fun. So they also maintain a um, hijack journals checker. So again, is a crowdsourced Google sheet. Um, but what they do is look for um, like the name of a journal. They'll take like the hijacked URL and then go they'll have the original journal and then sometimes they'll have like a different URL. Sometimes these journals were just in print. So they, you know, didn't have a website. Um, sometimes the website itself gets hacked. Other times the website, they make like a clone of it using a different um, like URL. A lot of these aren't active. I would show an example, but almost all of them get 404 errors, which is good that they got taken down. Um, but it's always helpful to to double check things here. I will send all of these links out later. Um, so like I was saying, generally relying on watch lists, not as helpful as developing skills because they get more sophisticated all the time. They'll come up with new ways of doing these things. Um, so some helpful guidelines you can check against. So think check submit is one that um, I pulled like a lot from my checklist on. So basically what this is, is it's a, it's just a tool that kind of help you think through a list of different um things you want to look for that are good, things you want to look for to avoid, um, whether or not a publisher is suitable for you. So, you know, the think step is just like, are you submitting to a good journal? Is this even the right um, journal for your work? Um, then once you get to, once you've chosen one, you get to the checklist. Um, it'll have you think through these different things. Like, is this a known journal? Can you get the latest papers? Um, Oh yeah, this, like I was talking about before, that the name is unique. It's not the same or sort of intentionally easily confused with another journal. Can you cross-check it in the ISSN portal? Um, information about who the publisher is, if they're clear about the type of peer review, where it's indexed or archived, clarity of fees. Um, so we've gone through some of this already. Um, this is the other one I wanted to point out because I think this is a pretty good list of um like whether or not the publisher is a current member of a recognized industry initiative so i showed you so if they're a current member of cope follow its guidelines that's good um i showed you doaj and oaspa already um but there's um that doesn't cover like non uh, North American or European journals a lot of the time. Um, so they have these other sites you can look at. So here's like an organization where you can um, check like African journals to see if they're part of their publishing groups. So that's that's the one we looked at earlier. Um, or this one for journals that are published in um, Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Central America, or Mongolia. Seems very specific. Um, so there's two that are for like Latin American journals. This one uh, is Latin American, but also includes um, the Caribbean, Spain, and Portugal. Um, same thing for this. So, and then the last thing is it's the member of another trade association. So, you know, might be associated with that or might be associated with a university if it's a lot smaller. Um, so if you're able to check most of the things on the list, then 
they say that's that's pretty good. They also came out with like a sister list that's for conferences recently with this think, check, attend, which I think is very helpful too. This site's a little bit less robust than the other one. Actually, I haven't been putting links in the chat, but I'm going to share these because I think these, they'll at least link out to the other things we looked at. Um, They're probably the most helpful ones to have. So on their checklist, they have um information about the sponsors, whether or not you can easily identify the venue if it's not online, if it's in person. Um, a copy, yeah, I'm going to email all of this out along with the recording once that's ready. Um, then, and the links are all in there too. Um, sort of whether the fees are clear. If you're aware of these sponsors, yeah, engineering and biomedical research tend to be the ones where, because there's they're so much like industry related in them uh, or industries that'll sponsor conferences. Um, that's kind of enmeshed with them. Um, information on the conference website, whether it's um, presented in a proper way, whether or not they have proceedings isn't going to apply to everything, but that's these are kind of still something to look at. Um, having an editorial committee or a board is, is pretty important, I think. Um, usually the list of keynotes for speakers early, so if you've heard of them or um, if they know that they've been put on this website and listed as the keynote speakers, because the same way they'll put people... Um, on a journal website is the editorial board without their knowledge. They'll sometimes do that with a keynote speaker. Um, I read this article once where this um, the researcher was talking about how he went to a conference website and was very surprised to see like a photo of him wel welcoming people to the conference when he had not heard of it before. Um, so that's, that's distressing. Um, but typically they should be clear about, you know, even if you haven't heard of them, like where they're, what university they're affiliated with or what research institution they're affiliated with. Um, and then if they're clear about sort of how things are edited and the review it uses. So it's sort of the, the conference version of it. Um, and the last thing is you can always ask me. Um, I know sometimes like I'm giving you this whole list of, of things you have to check and maybe you don't have time to do it. Um, you're really not bothering me if you give me like the link to a journal and you're not sure about it or a conference and you're not sure about it and I get to sit there and like go through all these lists and look for things you're giving me a gift because that's like a fun scavenger hunt for me so that is also a thing that the library can help with but um a thing I particularly want to help with so I'm always I'm always happy to do that for you um so we have some example scenarios um, of different journals and different conferences. But before we get to this, we don't have to go through all these. If anyone has any questions or anything they like a journal they're unsure about that they'd rather have me look at instead, um, we can do that too. So I will let you either unmute or type in the chat while I have a sip of water. I'm waiting now seven seconds well, it feels very long okay we'll just go to the first one then um I'll, I'll launch a poll or we can discuss what we'll decide so i'll put the link in here but just in case you're on a device that doesn't allow you to um look at things and be in this zoom simultaneously so here's a link to the first one we have the uh British Open Research Publications uh, Journal, Open Journal of Nuclear and Particle Physics. Um, we've got this. I'll flip through the different pages. Editor board, okay, very good. Aim and scope, great. Okay, empty, great. Author guidelines, oh, we have some guidelines, okay. You can email them. Um, Okay, we've got we've got this information. Oh, what unit measurement to use? So they have some guidelines. Um, payment options. Oh, good. They make okay two hundred dollar U.S. dollars publication fee. They'll take it through Western Union or bank transfer. Uh, and then archives. We have more question marks. Okay, I. I'm going to launch a poll for this because I'm curious what you think. Um, I have I have my chat window covering that. Okay, so do you think this journal or conference is deceptive, predatory, or fraudulent? I'll give you a few moments to answer this.
Most of us have answered. I'll share it just so we have time to get through the rest. Uh, it is unanimous. We all agreed that this one is. Um, that's that's kind of a softball one I started with. Um, I mean they don't they don't have like any information for most of the things. This is this is an example where I was talking about how some of them are like particularly egregious. Um, that they'll just be. Um, it'll be like nothing except how to pay um and then there were a lot of um sort of spelling or grammatical errors in this which again usually shouldn't on its own isn't as big of a deal as people say it is but if it's allegedly a british publication they they probably would have native english speakers writing and checking this stuff so okay that one's fun um we're gonna move on to the next one Oh, whoops, not what I wanted to do. So we're now looking at the Journal of Hate Studies. I will put it in the chat so we can also see, and I'll show a few things on here. So they're on volume 18, issue one. They've got their DOAJ seal here. You also don't have to stay on this website. I realize I'm not giving you a lot of time to like go through and double check and see if this actually shows up um, in DOAJ. Let's see, they link to it. Okay, they just link to it, not to their thing on there. Um, we'll look at their policies, their editorial team, and a lot of people associated with this university. What the focus and scope are, that's important. How often they publish, they have their open access policy. Oh, they've put some statistics on here. That's interesting. Um, different issue themes. Show the different articles. Okay, we've looked at this one enough, I think. Open the poll again. For this one. All right, so what do we think about this one? And it so we can get through the other ones. Most of us agree. No, it's I mean it's it doesn't look as like robust as some like major publisher sites. It's a university website. We can see on the URL it's associated with this particular university. Um it's it's just smaller than a lot of journals, probably, um, but not not malicious. Um and if you go and check, they are actually um indexed in DOAJ and they do have their seal. So there's another one. Okay, journal number three. So I put the link in there if you want to look at it. Um, they have a link to make it in uh, English. So we'll refresh this. We've got the, yeah, it is a Catholic school. I picked that one because March Madness just happened. And that's usually what I associate them with. <laughs> um, then... Uh, so we've got the Bulletin of National Technical University HPI series. It's an interesting name. That about the journal, what the target audience is, what the ISSN is. It's linked to the portal. It does link to the portal. Okay. Cool. Um. Let's see, we've got information about the editor. We've got the editorial board staff. Yeah, here are these people. Here are the members of the board. Um, I've got a link to Google Scholar. Oh, okay. About our DOAJ seal. Let's see if that links to them in there. It does. Okay. So some of them will have direct ones. So I'll go to about and then I'll, I'll launch the poll and see what their ethics policy are. what the ethical principles for reviewers are. Okay. I don't see that not worded that way that often. That's cool. Okay. So we'll look at this one. Do we think that this journal or conference is deceptive, predatory, or fraudulent? Hmm. 
All right, I will end the poll. So we've agreed no. I thought this one might be more split since it's a little trickier. There's a few things in here like this like Copernicus index. Sometimes that's people are like, yeah, that's that's less of a of a thing. Um, but yeah, they actually do have a DOAJ seal, which is cool. Um, I mean the sort of English version of some of the writing isn't this is like an example of how maybe it's like, oh, they made a few errors, but it is primarily a journal. It's based in Ukraine at a Ukrainian institution. So um, that's that's going to be what most of it is. So it's probably a legit journal. I don't see any, like, major issues with it. They publish in multiple languages, that kind of thing. And they use open journal systems. The same thing as the last one. Um, okay. One more journal we will look at. And there's a few conferences. So... Now we're going to look at the yeah, Google Scholar. That's the other one, too. Like, we'll say I'm indexed in Google Scholar, but Google Scholar doesn't index. It just, like, web crawls and find things. Um, so typically, if they're displaying that prominently, I'm just kind of, yeah, that's a good point. I'm kind of like, eh, maybe not. Um, but other than, than that, they're mostly okay. And we can always, if you're unsure, you can always double check that one um, against, um, uh, like, Cabal cobbles if they show up in there see if they show up in any of the like hijacked journal or falsely said that they're part of doaj list things like that um so we've got the european journal of botany plant sciences and phytology they've got their description here Let's see their editorial board okay so it is yeah a european journal got people based all over the place is interesting um now we've got our link to pay publication fee we have author guidelines okay so they have like a a style guide here I guess other journals that they put out. Okay. What do we think about this one? I'll end the poll in the interest of time. Uh, yes, we all agree that this one is. Um, this is one that showed up on the DOAJ list of like places that said that like falsely claimed to be indexed there and they're not. I didn't actually, that's where I found this. I didn't actually look up this address, but I'm, I'm interested what it is. It might be one of those construction sites. Um, again, this one has things you don't want to see necessarily, which is... Um, that they have very prominent links to pay for things. One thing I found that was interesting is they've got um, like information about their editorial board. Um, usually what you find is like they claim to be an international journal and then the um, editorial board isn't from a lot of different countries. They're all from like one place. Um, but this one has like the opposite thing in that it's saying it's like a European American journal and then it has people on the editorial board from all over the place. Um, which I thought was interesting. Um, but yeah, this this one I'm I'm curious to see where they what happens when you look them up in in Cabels. I think I still have that open. Maybe. Well, we'll see if they're in DOHA because they said that they were in there um yeah it doesn't show up um i think they were on yeah they were on this list of uh things that aren't actually in here so let's see if they show up in journal letters too this is just like a fun scavenger hunt see if they get in trouble they might not be in here at all yeah okay they've shown up um their predatory report what let's see what their violations are um so they do actually have an oh they don't have an editor listed that's the problem they don't really have a clear review policy um 
Yeah, falsely claims indexing in well-known databases. We know they did that with DOAJ. Oh yeah, they'll do that with JCR and Scopus. Those are other two good places you can check. Um, yeah, so those are, so good job everyone. We got them all right. Um, and then there's some conference examples I have. I won't show you both of the other ones. I'll just show you one. Cause this one's fun. Okay, we'll do this chemistry conference. The 18th International Conference on Chemistry and Medicinal Chemistry. They've got a little countdown until it starts. Um, it's in a few months. They've got some committee members. I'm gonna be in London. So, um, okay, last poll. Um, do you think this one, this conference in this case, is deceptive or predatory or fraudulent? Sessions are... Market analysis. Like a theme for the year. What about their sponsors? Okay, so these are how you can become a sponsor. Okay. We we agree that this one is um fraudulent, which it is. This one's fine. This one I found in an article where somebody was um invited to um or they submitted something to there with them and their co-author, and their co-author was like a long dead, like Nobel Prize winning scientist. And they um got back to her within like a few hours and were just like, Yeah, you please do this, like please present at this conference, like without reading it. Um then, I mean, if you click on, like, venue, here's their venue information. Like, they should have an actual venue. Um, so they don't have a lot of information on here. What they do have is a very robust way to register and pay for this conference. Um, so this one, I think, is sort of less obvious, especially when compared with, like, the first journal we looked at, which was, like, clearly just, like, a nothing website. This one, you have to, like, click around and, and dig in and, like, see what... Um, because it, 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 it looks more legitimate than a lot of these suspicious ones. Um, but we can uh, register to be null participant. Oh, oh no, we missed early booking. It's a shame. Could have made that. Okay, so that I think was fun. But if anyone else has anything else they like want to look through, I'm also always happy to do that too. Um, so... If I, I can take any other questions in our last few minutes, um, also thank you for coming. And if you have anything you want to like talk about further, I'll also be again sending all of this out. Um, once I have the recording like edited, I'll send out a link to this recording and then I'll send out on um, the slides, um, which will have the links to everything we looked at today. But in the meantime, if you have questions or aren't sure about a particular journal um, or a particular like email you get from something, um, feel free to reach out. Um, but thank you for coming. I'll also stop recording now just in case you have any questions that you don't want to show up in the recording. <laughs>